the city's 2015 premier mayoral debate series, presented by Belmont University, the Tennessean, and broadcast partner WSMV-TV. I'm Harry Chapman, Director of Special Projects and Major Gifts at Belmont University, and it's our honor to welcome you to the Massey Performing Arts Center and our Belmont campus. I will be introducing the candidates to you this evening, and I would ask that you hold all applause until all candidates have been introduced. I'll be starting at my right, and we'll do this alphabetically. So please join me as we welcome Megan Barry. Megan is a two-term at-large councilwoman who's worked as a corporate executive, and most recently, the ethics and compliance officer for the Premier Incorporated, a healthcare company. Megan, good to have you with us. Second will be Charles Robert Bone, a local business owner and lawyer who runs a law practice that represents businesses and government entities throughout the state. Mr. Bone, good to have you with us. Thank you. Next, please welcome David Fox. David is a former Metro Nashville School Board Chairman who most recently worked at Titan Advisors, a hedge fund based in New York. Welcome, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Next, Bill Freeman. Bill is co-founder of Freeman Webb, a property management and real estate investment company, and the former director of downtown urban development for MDHA. Mr. Freeman, welcome. <coughs> Next, Howard Gentry. Howard is 20th Judicial District's criminal court clerk for Davidson County, a former Nashville vice mayor, and a two-term councilman at large. Mr. Gentry, welcome. Thank you. Next, Jeremy Cain. Jeremy was CEO of LEAD, an organization that runs seven Nashville charter schools, and pre uh, previously he was a speechwriter for former Massachusetts Senator John Kerry. Mr. Kane, welcome. Thank you. Next, Linda Eskin Ribovic, who served as executive positions at IBM, Dale, and several other private corporations before taking her current position as CEO of Consensus Point, a consumer marketing research firm. We welcome all seven candidates to the stage this evening. You may. And now, please let me introduce our moderator for the evening from the Tennessean, David Plazas. David? Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. Thank you to the candidates, to the audience, both here at Belmont University and the audience at home watching on the Tennessean, the Tennessean app or WSMV Channel 4. We've already explained the ground rules to the candidates and the audience here, so let's begin with the questions. Round one, part one, focuses on leadership. This first question will go to Megan Berry, Charles Robert Bone, and David Fox. Each candidate has 90 seconds to answer a question, so I'll start with a question. And as soon as the first candidate gets on stage and begins speaking, that's when time will start. So the question is, the Nashville Metropolitan Transit Authority started a new year-long strategic planning process to reset expectations and investments in transit after the failure of the AMP. Given the context of the present political environment and limited resources, what did you learn from the AMP and its fallout, and how would you inform this new process? And let's begin with Ms. Berry, please. Thank you to Belmont and to the Tennessee and, and to Channel 4 for having us here tonight, and thank you also for the audience and those at home who are watching. The question about the AMP, I think, is important because when we talk about transit, the AMP started that conversation. We've learned a lot from that conversation, and we know what we need to do going forward. We need a bold vision for transit that is regional and local. And in my administration, we will engage the public to have that conversation. That was probably the biggest opportunity gap with the AMP. But for me, this is about identifying funding. We need to make sure that we can aggressively go after federal dollars. We are behind our peer cities, and we need to get those dollars from the federal government to make sure that we can implement a bold, comprehensive transit system. That means light rail, that means buses, that means sidewalks, that means bike lanes, and that means greenways. In my administration, it means anything you're going to get on that is going to take you to some other place. I think what we need after the MTA finishes its comprehensive process 
is to make sure that the mayor's office has one vision for transit, and that vision will exist in my office, because what I will do is put all of those pieces of the transit pie into my administration, so that when you get on a sidewalk, it will take you somewhere. It will take you to a bus stop. When you get on a bike lane, you won't be blocked because of traffic, or you won't be blocked because of construction. And if we can thank get Thank you very much, Ms. Berry. Thank you. They are Mr. strictly doing it. <laughs> Mr. Bone. I think the thing that was most frustrating to me as a part of the AMP conversation is the 7.1 miles that was proposed from Five Points to White Ridge Road was just intended to be the backbone of a larger system. But even I didn't understand that until the end of the conversation. I think what we, where we failed was being able to articulate, well, what does phase two or phase three or phase four look like? And if you were anywhere other than on that 7.1 miles, you had questions as to how that benefited you. Now we have the opportunity to reset that conversation. I think of it statistically. What the statistics tells us is 15% uh, capacity. So right now we have much more capacity in our current system, which means we need to have a far more efficient system than we have. 32% of our riders are choice riders, meaning they're choosing to ride the bus, which means we have to have a more efficient system. 54% of the workers in the region live in another county in which they work, which means we have to make this regional and more long-term. And finally, 85% of the people who are choosing or riding the bus walk to the bus stop, which means this has to be multimodal. I think the next mayor will have the opportunity to take advantage of the new MTA strategic plan, which I think will bring more efficiencies to the current system, be more dependable, and begin to break things down corridor by corridor. And that next mayor will also be able to take advantage of what Mayor Dean started, which was the mayor's regional caucus, where we're building deep consensus within the region. But ultimately, we have to have a local plan that connects to a regional plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Fox. You know, whether one liked the AMP or not, there's really good news. And we've knocked on about 35,000 doors across Davidson County. And everybody across the county, no matter where they live, understand we have to get this right. You know, we've seen other cities like Atlanta and maybe 25, 30 years ago, Los Angeles, once great cities, once the it city, didn't address these issues. And they allowed the growth to essentially destroy what made them special. So I'm very excited that all over the town, there's a real sense of urgency to take care of this issue. Now, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out to what extent can we have the private sector underwrite some of the cost of this? Because we're coming at some of these infrastructure needs at a time when we have a very different looking balance sheet. We have much more debt on the books. And so I'm eager to see if we can find ways to offload some of the responsibility uh, and maybe the operations to the private sector. Because it's essential that we get this right and we act with urgency. Um, and I'm very optimistic given the sense of urgency around the city that we can take care of it. Thank you. Every candidate at this moment has the opportunity for a 30 second rebuttal. So for this first round, they have a maximum two 30 second rebuttals. They can rebut their own question or within another question. Does anybody have a rebuttal for this question? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna move on to the next set of questions. So this question is for Mr. Freeman and Mr. Gentry. Nashville's high schools, Hume Fogg and Martin Luther King Jr. were recently named the best in the state, but that's juxtaposed with data commissioned by the Nashville Public Education Foundation showing that the county's schools had the lowest achievement in all of Tennessee. What can and will you do as mayor to bridge that gap? Mr. Freeman. Thank you. One of the frustrating things for me has been the dialogue about our public uh, education system. We have some wonderful schools in Davidson County. Uh, they have made great progress over the last six or seven years. Um, but the dialogue is all about how bad our schools are compared to Williamson County or, or Rutherford County or Wilson County. And one of the things that is driving corporate relocations outside of Davidson County is this discussion of our schools. I don't think we're treating our schools fairly. They're doing a terrific job. Uh, I think there's a lot to brag about Davidson County Public Education. I intend to do that as mayor. We have an elected school board. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount the mayor can do, but I'll be a cheerleader for public education, for public school teachers, and trying to uh, raise the bar for public education. Every percentage point we raise the budget from 42% to 43% uh, adds something in the range of $19 million for education. If we raise it two points, it's $40 million. 
So there's a lot that, more that we can do for public education, but we can start by talking fairly, speaking fairly about the job that teachers and public education is doing. They're not getting a fair shake. They're doing a lot better job than, uh, than the narrative. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. <laughs> Mr. Gentry. Thank you. Uh, my 15-year-old daughter is a student at Hume Falls. I do understand how great that school is. I attended Pearl High School, which is now Martin Luther King. It was greater then. Really, no, it's, it's, a great, it's, it's a great school also. But one thing about those schools, they have great reputations. Because they have great reputations, everybody wants to go there. Parents who send their children there, a lot of them have the ability to transport the kids to provide what they need but there are other parents that really stress and struggle to get their kids there too because it's such a great school. They have great teachers, they have the best teachers. They are priority schools. I will work with the school system to build up the reputation of the other schools. I will work with the school system to suggest that they place the top teachers in our other high schools. It's not so much that the schools are better, it's just that we are spending more effort and more priority in those schools. So let's do it across the board. Let's give the other schools an opportunity to hold their banners up. They all have great assets and we just need to brag about them a lot more. And I'm gonna be that mayor that will be in those schools, that will be bragging about them and that will be supporting their efforts too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. At this moment, does any candidate, Mr. Kane has a rebuttal for 30 seconds, and then we'll go to Mr. Fox after that. Mr. Kane. Yeah, I think, uh, excuse me, I'm going to disagree with uh, Bill Freeman in that the mayor can't do very much about schools. We've seen with Mayor Dean that you can do something about it. We have an unprecedented opportunity coming forward here when we have a new mayor and new superintendent about to take office at the same time. That relationship is the most important relationship. Talking about education has to be the most optimistic, collaborative, and successful thing we do. And I remember when I was knocking on doors 10 years ago when people said our kids were getting a great education. They weren't. We stepped up and did something about it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Fox. If, if your child's in a school that's failing, would you call it a terrific school? We've seen the numbers. We have school after school after school that is not getting the job done, especially for low-income kids. To call the school system broadly terrific, that's not something I'll be doing. And when I was board chair, I really understood and saw how a mayor who's engaged is actually the critical player in improving our schools. The elected school board sometimes is effective, sometimes is not. But if you have a mayor who understands the issue and is a co collaborator, Thank you a very much, Mr. Friend, Fox. Appreciate it. Any other rebuttals? Mr. Bowen. I think as we begin to understand that 24,000 of our kids will end the school year this month in a different school in which they started, and the correlation between that and lack of affordable housing, lack of efficient transportation, 73% of our kids live in poverty, 2,900 of which are homeless. I think now we now understand this cannot be the exclusive responsibility of that teacher or principal. That's something we all have to sign up for the accountability of and make these community priorities, not just school system priorities. Thank you. Any other rebuttals before we move on? Ms. Berry. Well, I agree that there are bright spots in our public schools. I also think that there are challenges. We need to make sure that the 72% of the children who are on free and reduced lunch have all of the opportunities they can. That's why in my administration, we'll have universal pre-K, because we know that if we invest in that child, they will have a much better opportunity over the success of their life. And it is our responsibility to be the adults in the room and to make sure that all of our children have equal opportunity, no matter what your zip code. Thank you. Any final rebuttals? Very well, we're going to move on then. So this uh, next question in this round is going to be for Mr. Kane and Ms. Eskin Rebervik. People in Nashville neighborhoods have been concerned that they were blindsided by news, for example, of the proposed moves of the county jail to Antioch and the Nashville Police Headquarters to Jefferson Street in North Nashville. If you were mayor, how would you have approached these plans any differently and explain how you would address community concerns? Mr. Kane. Thank you. 
One of the first things that I want to do as mayor is to revitalize the Office of Neighborhoods. When you think of Nashville's strengths, neighborhoods is at the core of who we are as a city. No two neighborhoods are alike. East Nashville has its unique qualities, as does Sylvan Park and Bellevue and Bordeaux. So what I would do is create an Office of Neighborhoods, Nonprofits, and Faith. Because not only our neighborhoods make us unique, but so too do our nonprofits. So much of us volunteer our time and our money in our nonprofits. We saw it in the flood about what they were able to do and help bring back our neighborhoods. And our faith is at the core of who we are as Nashvillians. We have over 700 places of worship across our county, and that diversity is what makes us special. So when I look at talking about where we'd move the jail, where we would move the police precinct, or engaging our neighborhoods, that's where it would start. Because as, neighbor, as mayor, excuse me, it would not be coming from the top down. It would be coming from the neighborhoods up. I learned this with my wife who was on the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association. We are engaged in our neighborhood, not only with neighborhood issues, but with schools issues. As mayor, I would start in the community. Whether it was a conversation like the AMP or with the jail or the precinct is to start first in that neighborhood. So as mayor, I will begin in those neighborhoods with folks who live there so that no one is ever taken by surprise when we have a project. Thank you, Mr. King. Ms. Eskin Grebelbrook. Good evening. One of the most important things a leader does is set a vision. And from the beginning of my campaign, I have set a vision of building a smarter Nashville. And what that means is we're going to bring business, discipline, and innovation to make sure that Metro government works efficiently and effectively. It means not just technology, but it means that we're going to combine technology with really bold ideas to make sure that Nashville is livable for all of our families. And I know about this because I've been a working mom. And that's why I am committed to making sure that I help everyone in our community balance a career and a family. And this is all about driving to consensus. This is all about making sure what a leader does, what a really good leader does, is make sure that everyone, no matter what side they're on, has a voice at the table. In fact, the company I have been leading as CEO for the past five and a half years is called Consensus Point. And I believe strongly in this. And that is how I've led my uh, businesses, that's how I've raised my family, and that's how I have run this campaign. Because I said we are going to run a positive campaign. No negative ads. We're not going to drive people apart. We're going to bring them together. And that is what needs to happen on this question that you've just asked about. In these communities, we need to bring Metro and police chief and the police team Thank you, Ms. Eskin, all together. Quick. Thank you. At this point, are there any rebuttals? Any rebuttals to this, uh, to this particular question from the candidates? Okay, with that I'll move on then. In this next part, these questions, now this question is for Mr. Fox, Mr. Gentry, and Mr. Kane. County business and community leaders have called for bold action on transportation and transit. The Nashville Next Plan has identified transit costs that range from about a billion dollars to more than seven billion dollars, depending on how expansive and regional the new system is. What is your preference for how big of an investment to make and how would you pay for it? So let's start with Mr. Fox, please. I believe the question was, what's my preference of, uh, what was the end of the question? For, for the regional transportation system, right. how much would you invest and how would you right. pay for it? Um, so that's really on how I look at it. I don't like to come up with a dollar amount and say, let's spend that. I'd say, let's come up with a plan and figure out what we can afford and then sequence it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of our challenges here is we're trying to take on some massive infrastructure projects, which we have to do. And if we want to sustain the quality of life, we're going to have to make these investments. But we're doing it at a time when our balance sheet has a lot more debt on it than it used to. That's why I spent a lot of time, like I said earlier, you know, trying to see if we can have private sector partners. You know, it's common in other places to partner with the transportation firm, engineering firm, and have them own and operate a system. So that's one possibility. We'll see if it's viable or not. There are other, there are other options. You know, not everything, I was uh, in Salt Lake City with the Chamber of Commerce a few weeks ago looking at their light rail program and it's very nice and it's uh, successful in that people seem to enjoy it, but it costs a lot of money. There's a big operating expense when you spend money on mass transit. And so it's not just the upfront expense, it's the operating expense. So I'm very focused on that. I want us to have a lot of consideration for uh, the bus system. There are a lot of enhanced bus services that we can do. Then there's some low hanging fruit 
you know, synchronizing our, uh, synchronizing our, our lights is, is one thing that would uh, help instantly. So I don't want to come into it with a dollar amount. Let's just find out what the various alternatives are, and then we can find out what we can, what we can afford to do then. Thank you very much, Mr. Fox. Mr. Gentry. You know, we talk about cost a lot, and, but we never talk about how much it costs if we don't do anything. If we continue to stay still, then nothing's going to happen, and it's going to get worse. So the cost is going to be a great cost, but it's a cost that's going to have to be shared. It's a regional concern, and we're going to have to get along with the different counties, our neighbors, because it affects all of us. There is many people moving out of Nashville to work outside of Nashville as there are coming in, so it affects everyone. So what I would look at as it relates to funding is a regional funding plan where everybody participates and the cost is, is uh, shared between all. But as I look at Nashville, what I see is a city that has the ability to have a great public transportation system, but we have not ramped it up to its full capacity. And we have to do that. And as mayor, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I am going to fund our MTA to its full capacity, implement the plan that will provide transportation for all of us so that we will feel comfortable and confident that we don't have to drive our cars, that we can get back and forth uh, in a timely fashion, and we can depend on our local system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gentry. Mr. Kane. We had a phrase at Lead Academy at our schools, and it was whatever it takes. And when we set a bold agenda and a bold vision about getting 100% of our kids to and through high school and accepted to a four-year college, many looked at us and said we were crazy. But it was bold, it was big, and it set a big goal on the horizon. So the answer I would say in this question is whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to say to the grandmother that came to our town hall after sitting in a ditch to wait for her bus, whatever it takes, we're going to make sure you have a safe place in a covered place to catch the bus. We're going to say whatever it takes to a student and a family that their school of their choice is not going to be limited by the transportation that's there. We're also going to say whatever it takes for folks that can get to the affordable and obtainable homes, whether they're in Antioch or in Donaldson or in Bellevue. As we look at the actual costs, here is my promise to you, is that we will leverage our existing resources to the best extent possible. When we think about it right now, we have two transit systems in Nashville, one at MTA and one for MNPS. If we combine those and leverage those dollars, we put a great down payment on a start to a comprehensive uh, transit system. We also have to look at technology as the future of transit. Right now, you can pay your bills or pay for a Starbucks, but you still have to carry a $1.70 to ride our bus. That is low cost, high impact. So the answer would be whatever it takes to help our parents, our grandparents, and our kids get wherever they need to be. Thank you very much. At this moment, uh, Ms. Eskin Rebervik has a rebuttal. Our next mayor has to have the courage to step up and deal with bold, I bring bold ideas to deal with the challenges that Nashville's facing and transportation is one of the biggest of those. And I've already started that. I released a transportation policy paper where I talked about not just goals, but I talked about those bold new ideas that we need to do in the short term, mid term, and long term. And I encourage you to go take a look at that because it talks about how technology can speed up traffic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other rebuttals? Very well, we'll move on to the next question. And actually, we'll be starting with Ms. Eskind Reverick on this question, and then the second person will be Ms. Berry. We'll have this question. From Green Hills to Germantown to East Nashville, neighbors have expressed concerns about the mixed zoning in their, in their communities that has brought mega mansions next to smaller homes, created slim and tall shotgun houses next to single family units, and destroyed historic homes. Do you support this kind of development continuing in the future and what kind of attention should be put to the zoning laws of the city of Nashville? And let's start with Ms. Eskin Reprovic, please. Okay. You know, as a woman in business, I have learned that a successful leader is someone who's determined and never gives up, even when others doubt your potential. You know, if you take a look at topics like this, it is really important that we step out there and look at 
innovative ways that we can never give up on this problem. Look at the whole city and think about different uh, types of ideas. Be real innovative and find ways to solve problems because there are people that are in the millennials, like my children, who are looking for co-housing opportunities. In fact, there's one in Germantown right now that would be perfect for new millennials. Uh, our, my mother is aging. She needs the type of um, homes that will take care of people that need special services. And I would look forward to pushing forward incentive, incentives or other incentive, incentivized developers to build those kind of homes. And in the middle, we know where we're going. We know in the future that 200,000 more people are coming into Nashville. We need to plan. We need to think about that future and make sure that we look at where the density needs to be and make sure that we don't overbuild and overplan. And so I, I am focused on planning and bringing those leadership skills of determination to make sure that this happens and it happens right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eskin Rubervick. Ms. Berry. Neighborhoods are the fabric that knit all of us together in Nashville. And the one thing that I hear the most on the campaign trail is that people want to stay in their homes, they want their neighborhoods to be safe, and they want them to be affordable. So when we look at the impact of some of the building on our neighborhoods, neighbors are, are, are distressed. In my administration, I will empower neighbors by putting more resources into the Office of Neighborhoods. Because what neighbors need to know is how to deal with their government. They need the tools that they can go to the Planning Commission and that they can have a voice when they are seeing change in their neighborhoods. We also need to embrace the Nashville Next Plan. That puts the density along our corridors and our pikes. Making sure that density exists is gonna help us with all of the new people that are coming. It's also going to drive our transit options and it's going to make sure that we have mixed uses that are industrial, light industrial, worker make space, and a place for people to live. So for me, it really is about those neighborhoods. I love my neighborhood. I know that you love yours. So I know you want the same thing I do, which is to make sure that those neighborhoods stay safe, they stay affordable, and that you as a neighbor have a tool to make sure that any change that is coming is something that you're prepared for. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, are there any rebuttals from the candidates? No candidate rebuttals? Then I will move on. This next question is for Mr. Bone. We'll start with you and then Mr. Freeman. The question is, the new diversity committee has made a series of 10 recommendations to diversify Nashville's workforce, address inequities in pay, and call on having an annual diversity summit. Which of these recommendations do you embrace, and are there any that cause you pause? And again, Mr. Bone. Certainly, we appreciate the work of the Human Rights Commission uh, that, that was the genesis for this work and ultimately the task force and the, and the report and the recommendations that have been issued. But for those of us who've been paying close attention to what's been going on for the last several years, those findings were not a surprise. 44 of our 50 department heads are white. 67% uh, of our workforce is male. We know we have diversity issues throughout government. And while I appreciate the work of the task force and would like to see us begin those uh, early on uh, and early on in my administration, I think more powerful than anything, any recommendation we can do is to embrace a mindset and a mindset of diversity and a mindset of inclusiveness. If anybody knows anything about our law firm, I think we probably have the most diverse law firm uh, in the city, if not in the Southeast. And we got that way by being intentional. We didn't get that way by just accepting resumes. We got that way by waking up every morning thinking, how do we grow? How do we become more diverse? And how do we look like the community in which we serve? So what I would say is, while I appreciate all the work that's been done, and I hope to be able to be in a position to begin implementing some of those recommendations, first and foremost, diversity will start at the top. And it will be a mindset that we embrace across the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Freeman. My company, like Charles Roberts, uh, reflects the diversity uh, of our city. Um, and that doesn't happen by accident. Uh, you work at that every single day. We've got to do a better job in, in metro government, uh, uh, hiring, promoting women, minorities. Um, we've got uh, departments in our government uh, that 92% of the new hires in the most recent, uh, one of the most recent classes uh, 
were white. Uh, we've got to do a better job of that. We can do a better job than, than that. We're doing a better job in the private sector many times than, than the city is. I'll make a difference in that effort. Uh, we'll run the city the same way that we run our companies, and we'll get that same diversity that, uh, in city government that we're talking about. Thank you very much. A rebuttal from Mr. Gentry. Yeah. Well, I would like to speak for city government. I'm the criminal court clerk, and when I walked in my office a few years ago, I said we were going to do the right thing because we had those kind of numbers. Today, we have eight employees. Fifty-six uh, employees are percent are women. We have minorities at 32 percent. On my leadership team, six of the eight are women. It can be done by doing the right thing. I am going to be the chief diversity officer of the Metro government, and I'm going to tell everybody in government to do the right thing, look at my department as an example, and you'll see the right thing done, and Metro government will look like it should look if Howard Gentry is your mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other rebuttals? Ms. Eskin Rubbervick. I know firsthand what this question is all about. I worked very hard over the past 32 years working my way up through three of the world's largest corporations. And diversity is so important. It is important for us in Nashville to make sure that our metro government represents the faces and the thoughts and the backgrounds of our city. And it's not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's because you get better results. And I assure you, when I am mayor, we will have a diverse Thank government you very much, and Ms. get Eskimo better Robert. results. Thank you. Any other rebuttals before we move on? Any other rebuttals? Okay, now actually we finished round one. So now we are at the lightning round. In this round, each candidate will be asked to answer in one sentence. And so what we're gonna do is go for Ms. Berry and then progressively move to, toward Ms. Eskind Reprovic. So the first question is this. Since we are Music City, what song would you say best describes who you are as a person and as a leader? <laughs> Well, the only song I have in my head tonight is Voting for Bone. So <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Bone. Megan took my answer. <laughs> I'm going uh, Garth Brooks. I got friends in low places. Perfect. <laughs> Mr. Fox. I guess I should think of a Johnny Cash song. Um, I'll pass on this one. I can't right. give you one time. <laughs> Mr. Freeman. <laughs> I'll bring up a great song from the 60s, Tighten Up. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gentry. Mine's going to be gospel, Don't Give Up. Excellent. Mr. King. I'll embarrass my wife. Lionel Richie always makes me smile. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Eskin Reprovick. Looking at this beautiful building, I'm going to say the hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> Excellent. Our next lightning round question, we're just going to start from Ms. Eskin Rebervik and then go back to Ms. Berry. And the question is, who is a local community leader that you admire? And tell us why in one sentence. Mayor Dean. He's done an amazing job growing this city. Thank you. Mr. Kane. Uh, Mayor Fulton, because he set the tone for the last 30 years where he invested in the old convention center, but also at the same time protected the Ryman, invested in sewers, but also put bricks on Church Street, and that's the kind of balance I'd want as mayor. Thank you. Mr. Gentry. My mother, Carrie Gentry, who with Inez Crutchfield integrated the Democratic Women's Club and has kept Nashville progressive ever since. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Freeman. I think a great leader that spent a lot of time in Nashville was Governor Ned McWhorter, and I'm a huge Ned McWhorter fan. Um, he told it like it was and, and got results, so thank, I'd thank say you. Ned McWhorter. Mr. Fox. Uh, Randy Dowell, who started KIPP Academy uh, as our second charter school and has shown that all children, regardless of zip code, can achieve at very high levels. Thank you. Mr. Bone? Uh, Phil Bredesen, he was Visionary enough to understand putting the arena downtown would pay off 25 years in advance, as well as 
opportunistic enough to know that answering the phone when Bud Adams called would make Nashville an NFL city. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. And Ms. Berry. Pat Shea, she's the executive director of the YWCA because she's put an emphasis on fixing domestic violence in our community, and I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. So for the next lightning round question, I'm going to start with Mr. Bone, come all the way to Ms. Eskin Reprovic, and then end with Ms. Berry. So this is the lightning round question is, Nashville is known as it city today. What do you hope it will be called after you leave office? Mr. Bone. <laughs> Still the it city. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Fox. Right. Uh, that's the right answer. It should be the it city for the next 20 or 30 years. We can make some good decisions right now. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. Uh, you know, I like that answer. It, it, it's good. But, <laughs> but what we've got to do is solve this mass transit city. I'd like for the city to be known as a city that solved that mass transit city over the next eight years. Thank you. Mr. Gentry. I'd like to see Nashville called the It City for Everyone. Thank you. Mr. Kane. I'd like to say Education City, that we are the first city in the United States that really provides a high quality education for every single kid, no matter where they live. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Eskin Rubberbitt. A smarter Nashville, a Nashville that grew that works and that is recognized around the world as one of the most smartest cities. Thank you. Ms. Berry. A city that's thriving because we're moving. Thank you. So for our final lightning round question, we're going to start with Mr. Kane, go all the way to Ms. Berry, and end with Ms. Eskind Revervik. So the question is, building on that last one, what do you hope your legacy will be after you finish your term? Mr. Kane. I think in addition to education, it's the Casey Revitalization Project because I think it brings together all of the major projects we have to do and that will set the tone for the next 30 years. If we can do Casey Homes the right way, where we make it mixed income and tie it back into East Nashville, we put it on a transit line. There's a school on the property as well as Martha O'Brien. What we could do there would set the tone for the next 30 years and what we do at Edge Hill, what we do at Napier, Th thank and you, what Mr. we do King. throughout the entire county. Mr. Jensen. It was one, that was a very long compound sentence, but it's uh, Mr. Gen Mr. Gentry. Uh, so again, the question is, what do you hope your legacy will be after you finish your term? So Mr. Gentry, in, in one sentence, even if it's a compound sentence, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. I would like my legacy to be that, that Nashville is a city where the people are better. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. You know, I've talked about a plan to, to provide 10,000 affordable housing units. If we can do that over the next four years and provide housing for those of us that need that the most, need housing the most, there's nothing more important. Uh, you don't understand that until you don't have housing. So adding 10,000 affordable housing units is, is a high priority and something Thank you I'd very like much, Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Mr. Fox. I would like my legacy to be a city that has made the infrastructure improvements we need to make in transit and water, sewer, schools, so that we keep intact what keeps Nashville a very nice, special place, the civility, gentility, and southern feel of our city. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. Bowen. That we were bold enough to sustain our momentum, but responsible enough to diversify our prosperity in all of Nashville. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Berry. At the end of my eight term, I want everyone to have a better quality of life, a sidewalk to walk on, a school they can be proud of, a neighborhood that they love, and affordability that extends all the way to our county line with prosperity for all. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Ms. Eskin Rebovic. That everyone in Nashville, all the employees, all of the community, all Nashvillians are proud of the fact that we did build a smarter Nashville. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for the lightning round. Okay. So now, now we're moving on to round three. And round three is similar to round one in that you'll each have 90-second answers. You'll be uh, split into pairs or trios. 
but the focus instead of leadership is crisis management. So we'll get deeper into that aspect of it. This first question, we'll start with Mr. Gentry and the second person to go will be Ms. Berry. So the question is, the Dean administration is seeking to invest $100 million to build a flood wall and pump station to protect the city from a thousand year flood. However, recent reporting shows there were alternatives that were less expensive. Should the city council approve the bonds to move this project forward or what alternative should the city pursue? Mr. Gentry. Well, it's true that we had flood and it's true that if we had it, it can happen again. So something needs to be done. The concern I have with the flood wall is not the cost. It's how it affects the rest of the community because the water comes into a city and it floods downtown. If that water is diverted, diverted, what happens to communities that are not downtown? And so what I am most concerned about right now is what we do about the other communities. And the truth is that that is gonna take more research, more study, and it's also going to be the answer. So that's the answer I'm gonna be looking for and then when that answer comes forward, then we're gonna move on it. So the Metro Council has an opportunity to vote now, and if they vote for the flood wall, then the next mayor is gonna to have to deal with it. And what I'm gonna be dealing with is the results of that decision that is made, and the results will be that we will also have to create a safer environment for those areas and those communities that are gonna be affected by the decision. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Gentry. Ms. Berry. Well, first of all, I'm shocked that I got this question. Uh, as the only member of the stage tonight that will actually have the ability to vote on this, I think it's important to think about a couple of things. This is the strongest plan to mitigate a flood for downtown. We did have a flood in 2010, and it impacted downtown significantly. This is the best flood mitigation plan that will protect downtown. But I have serious concerns about how we fund it and about how we continue to make sure that we have flood mitigation all across this county. When we look at the results of the flood, it wasn't just downtown that was impacted. There were lots of communities that were impacted. And we have spent the last seven and a half years working not just when we had this flood, but to make sure that any crisis that we might have is mitigated because we plan ahead. So when you think about putting in a flood wall, it's about making sure that you're preventing something from happening. But for me, as I said, it's about the funding mechanism. And I look forward to working with my colleagues to make sure that we can find the appropriate funding mechanism so that we don't take away from the ability to also impact and save other parts of this city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Are there any rebuttals from the candidates? Mr. Freeman. I'd just like to touch on this for a moment, but my frustration with the flood wall, uh, I'm sure it's a great idea, I'm sure we need it, uh, but the river flows through our county in, in nine different places, and the first thing that I knew about that flood wall was, was what I read in the Tennessee in the morning that it, it came out. Yes, it had been in the budget the year before, yes, it was on page, whatever it was in the budget, but there was no discussion, no public debate, none of you were involved in that discussion and neither was I. That's not acceptable. Thank you. Any other rebuttals? Okay, seeing no other rebuttals, we'll move on to the next question. So this next question is for Mr. Bone, Ms. eskin Rebervik, and Mr. Freeman. The question is this, Nashville's police received praise nationally over the way it handled the Ferguson protesters in the city last winter. However, if Nashville were to experience a crisis like that in Ferguson or Baltimore, what lessons can be learned from how those city's leaders handled those crises? And we'll start with Mr. Bone. Obviously, Nashville has a couple advantages that those cities don't have. We have leadership across the government and across the community and across our faith-based organizations that I think is second to none from those competitive peer cities. We also have a history in Nashville that's different than a lot of cities. And while we've had our fair share of problems in the civil rights era and on race relations, we've had unique alliances and relationships going back forever and ever in the city that allowed us to have less issues than other places had. However, 
it would be naive of us to think that just because we have great leadership and great history that we are immune from the type of issues that we've seen over the last year. Take Baltimore, the neighborhood where the rioting broke out in Sandtown, had the highest prison population of any census tract in Maryland, had 51% unemployment, and 61% of the folks who live there do not have a high school diploma. We have census tracts in neighborhoods and areas in Nashville that are not too dissimilar. Our opportunity to avoid an incident like that is to be talking about it now, but not just talking, but leveraging the investments and leveraging the opportunities and leveraging the business success in this city to ensure that we're investing in education, in job skills training, and in infrastructure to allow us to create jobs that would benefit everybody and to respond to areas like, very much like Sandtown and to be ahead of an issue like that. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Ms. Eskin, <laughs> I've dealt with crisis management at the highest levels at some of the world's largest corporations. In fact, when I was at KPMG, our team was brought in to FedEx to help their team make sure that that company was Y2K ready at the strike of midnight. And they were. And what I learned from that is that you have to have a really solid plan. And as your mayor, I commit that we will. And it's going to be about making sure that the police are involved and the communities are involved. Because I will stand by the police, but I will also stand by the community and make sure that every voice is heard and that we have a plan that's been communicated to everybody on how we will work in this kind of crisis. We will use the latest technology to make sure that everybody is communicated to and that we continue to let people be heard if they've got grievances and that we support those and that we learn from those. It is all about the culture, it is all about the leadership, and it is all about how you put a plan together that everybody feels a part of. I said this early, earlier, it is all about building consensus. And that is what I have done throughout my entire career, is help put plans together and make sure that everybody, everybody feels a part of it, and everybody knows what needs to happen when a crisis occurs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Freeman. Nashville, Tennessee is not Ferguson. We did a much better job um, dealing with, with the, uh, the, the uh, strike and the, the issues that, that came up uh, protesting Ferguson uh, than other parts of the country did. But let me tell you what we're not doing a good job of. That's taking care of our police officers. We're not giving them the raises that, that we need to, to. They're not even keeping up with the cost of living increases. Uh, it's outrageous what we've done to fire and police and metro workers uh, in terms of raises and salary increases. We've got to do a better job. They're the reason we didn't have a problem like Ferguson. We can do a better job. We ought to do a better job. They deserve it, and we ought to do it. Thank you very much. At this moment, are there any requests? Mr. Fox will uh, rebut, and then we'll go to Mr. Gentry after Mr. Fox. You know, at a minimum, we expect our mayor to have our back. What we saw in Baltimore was outrageous. Cops were sent, 15 cops were injured and sent to the hospital, 140 cars burned down, 10 buildings burned down. And the mayor says, I'm gonna give them space to destroy stuff. Yeah, it's just completely unacceptable. And you know, I have great regard for civil liberties, but I promise you, I won't go wobbly. Thank you very much. Mr. Gentry. You know, the reality is, is that we're dealing with a crisis situation in that situation at the ground level. You've got in Nashville a poverty rate that's almost 20%. People are stressed. You've got people incarcerated, minorities, who are at 60%. We have the opportunity, the potential for this happening. You need a mayor that understands all communities. You need a mayor that can work within these communities Thank you very much, and Mr. do Gentry. something about it. Thank Mr. you. Kane. Three quick points. One is we have to ensure that the greatest investment we make in our communities is not an increased police presence. Second, we do, as Mr. Freeman said, we do have to protect and serve those who protect and serve us. We need to increase the diversity of our police force as well as our fire department. And we need a mayor who's as comfortable in Casey Holmes as conference rooms downtown who can go out in the community and be heard and have a voice that is heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Any final rebuttals before we move forward? Okay, then we'll move on. 
This next question is for Mr. Kane and Mr. Fox. The question is, real estate development around Nashville has caused or will cause the demolition of public housing. Where will these people go and how will you address their social service and transit needs so they do not become forgotten people? Mr. Kane. I'll go back and talk more about the Casey Project because I think this is at the core of our affordable housing uh, discussion for the future. If you look at it, this is an incredible property and we have a choice as a city. We can demolish that property and we can put up high rises and we can increase the property tax base. But that's not the Nashville I know or the Nashville we know or the Nashville we love. But if we look at it as the potential uh, framework for how we can move forward as a city, it becomes a very exciting uh, opportunity and project. So think about it this way, we, have, we can make it mixed use, we can make it mixed income, we can make it a place where anybody in this room today wants to live in. That sends an incredible message that that is a place that's good enough for all of us. When we link it to transit, one of the biggest affordability challenges we have as a community is our lack of a transit system. Almost 30% of our cost comes from transit. We have to have a car, we have to have insurance and gasoline. So we have to think about linking that neighborhood with our transit system. It's about schools, it's about jobs as well. So I think Casey is the project that I would look at. My affordable housing plan is about increasing accessibility through transit, about abundance, making sure that we continue to create more housing and variety, not just for our millennials, but also our aging population, where they can age in place or have opportunities like micro housing that when they sell their home, they can stay in the neighborhood around those they love and the communities they've helped build up. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Mr. Fox. I mentioned, mentioned a little bit earlier that we've knocked on about 35,000 doors in my campaign. And what's been disappointing is about every four or five days, I'll have a conversation with someone at the front door, usually a senior citizen, who bought their home 30, 40 years ago for $30,000. And the developers come up to them, offered them what sounds like a great price, eighty, ninety thousand $90,000, and they take it. And first they find out, well, that was not really the market price. And secondly, they discover there's not another place in Nashville they can live. So all their infrastructure, all their family is in Nashville and because uh, to call attention to how quickly this problem is emerging. We've always had Reverend Bill Barnes and others you know, fighting this issue, but the velocity with which this has spiraled into a crisis is really astonishing. I had a conversation some months ago with a friend from Los Angeles who was living there 30 years ago and said the first hint that Los Angeles kind of the bloom was coming off the, the rose air was uh, affordable housing. It just came out of nowhere. And the working, uh, the folks, you know, the, the police officers, the dental technicians could no longer find a place to sit, stay. You know, there are three or four things we can do. The rental assistance demonstration program that MDHA has is gonna be, I think, a huge and very positive development for us. Um, it, it brings in a lot of private capital, allows to rebuild low income and also add affordable housing as well, mixed income. We need to put some more money in the barns. Thank you very well. much, Mr. Fox. Are there any rebuttals from the candidates? Mr. Gentry. You know, I asked this question when Preston Taylor was torn down. 900 left, 500 came back. And there they ended up in Madison and Antioch in depressed areas with no transportation. I'm going to develop an office of social equity. We're going to ensure when projects like this occur, those landing pads, those communities that are communities that all people deserve will be created and those si tragic situations will never happen again in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the other both, Mr. Freeman. You know, leadership is important, um, but, but so is heart. And we've got to, to be mindful of that as we look at these uh, residents that we're displacing. Uh, I've uh, talked about a plan, and you can, can look at it on my website, uh, to add 10,000 affordable housing units. And we frankly have a plan for the next four years to develop another 20,000 affordable housing units. That's what we've got to do. That's what, what these people out of, that are being displaced out of public housing need, and we've got to come up with a plan for that, and I've got one. Thank you. Thank you. Any other rebuttals? This is just a reminder that every candidate has two rebuttals. Mr. Freeman, Mr. Gentry, you have maximized your rebuttals for this round. Uh, so the next round, we're going to be starting with Ms. Eskind Reprovic and then going to Mr. Freeman. The question is, with all the growth in the community, which is expected to bring more than a million people to the Nashville region over the next 25 years, some have argued that Nashville has lost its way. Do you agree, and how can Nashville preserve its past and continue its prosperity? 
Ms. Eskind Reprovic. No, I don't agree that Nashville has lost its way. I believe that Nashville is a city that is a very unique and special place to live. And we just have to make sure that we bring everyone together to make it successful, that we listen to everybody. You know, when the University of Tennessee was at a, at a place where they needed help to make sure that the board and the administration was working effectively together, Governor Bredesen called me and asked me to go up there and work with, these, with the teams and come up with a process and an approach to make sure that they had a solid working relationship and could drive toward consensus. Nashville needs to be unified under one common vision. Nashville needs to be unified to make sure that everyone, everyone feels like Nashville is a place that's livable for them. I am gonna bring these skills as your mayor to make sure that everyone is part of the conversation, that we do have strong relationships amongst all of the community and our Metro government team just like we did up at the University of Tennessee, just like I've done in my 39 years in my career, and just like I did leading Consensus Point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Freeman. When I started in the real estate business uh, about 40 years ago, uh, the official population growth estimates for, for Nashville, Davidson County, uh, were 25,000 people a year. Um, we are now experiencing growth far greater than that. We've got 30,000 25-year-old and younger college uh, graduates moving to Nashville uh, every year. That's 85 a day, 25-year-old college grads, the prime demographic that every city is looking for, we've got them coming, coming to Nashville. We've got all kinds of growth going, taking place in Middle Tennessee. What I'm more concerned about is the growth, the, the corporate relocation and growth taking place outside our county in Williamson, Rutherford, and Wilson County. We've got to do a little better job uh, getting that growth in Davidson County, and uh, I'll be a jealous advocate for Davidson County, and, and we'll make a difference. Thank you very much. Are there any rebuttals from counties? Mr. Fox. Mayor Dean concludes every speech by saying, Nashville's better days, best days are ahead of us. And I think he's completely right. But I think it's important to understand the great days we're having now are not happenstance, but the result of great decisions made over the last 30, 40, 50 years. So I hope we have a mayor who understands we're not on autopilot right now, is prepared to do some active steering to make sure our quality of life is retained and the growth with which we're enjoying so much doesn't consume what makes Nashville special. Thank you very much. Any other rebuttals? All right, we'll move on. The next question is from Mr. Gentry. Mr. Kane and Mr. Bone. Over these past few months, the Dean Administration has announced numerous capital investments from the flood wall to the Bridgestone headquarters to the Convention Center redevelopment, and it has created the perception that Nashville has unlimited resources to invest. Should residents be concerned that we're investing too much too quickly? Mr. Gentry. I don't think residents should be concerned that we're investing too much too quickly. I think residents need to be more concerned about how we're going to manage our growth and how we're going to manage our city and what our vision is for the future. The fact is that Nashville doesn't need to be a bigger city, it needs to be a better city. And where our priorities need to be aimed now is at our people, at our infrastructure, to be sure that we can handle our growth, that we have the infrastructure that can sustain what we've already done. We have a community of people who are the true foundation of Nashville. We have a community of people who are the future of Nashville. We need to aim at our future. Our vision needs to be our people. For those who do not have opportunities, we need to reduce the barriers so that those people can have opportunities for job training, for job readiness, to make their lives better, to be better educated. As your mayor, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make priorities our infrastructure, our human infrastructure. That is our future. That is our today. That is our tomorrow. We can't do anything about what has been done now, what the investments are. We just need to hope that those investments will prove true and provide the revenue that we need. 
but what we can do is something about the future. And you are the future. If you're better, Thank you Nashville very much, will be Mr. better. Gentry. Mr. Kane. I said it the first day I announced and said it at every forum and we'll say it again tonight that the key question in this election is how we manage our finances going forward and still make the investments that we need to make to continue this growth. So let me start with how we manage those finances is we do need to be smart and we have put a lot on the company credit card, but we can continue to make those investments and we must and as your mayor, I will. When we think about what is going to fuel the next 30 years of our growth, it is going to be our education system, it is going to be how we invest in transit and third, how we connect with the world. Let me take those each one at a time. With our education system, Bill mentioned it earlier that folks are choosing Williamson County or Rutherford County. Think about the Nashville of tomorrow where every child has a great school and every neighborhood has a great school, that people will come here, people want to live here, but right now we've always been a tourist city. Now folks are coming and starting to rent and we need to turn them into tomorrow's buyers where they are in our neighborhoods and they want to send their kids to our school so they stay. With transit, think about the potential that we can unlock when you can put away the keys to your car and you can get throughout the county. Think about when you can live in the community of your choice and go to the school of your choice and the job of your choice. And third, most importantly, think about how we connect with the globe. My daughter is three years old. The schools that she will go to, the jobs that she uh, will go to, and the life she will build are not just here, not just nationally, but internationally. I want to be the mayor that makes those further connections Thank you very globally. much, Mr. Kane. Mr. Bone? I'm running for mayor for two reasons. One, as a city, I want us to affirmatively do all we can to keep the momentum of this city going. A city is very much like a business or very much like Belmont in regards to we're either moving forwards or we're moving backwards. Status quo does not exist. Status quo is a concept of fiction. But at the same time, Jeremiah 29, 7 says, seek the peace and the prosperity to the city to which I sent you, for where the city prospers, so shall its people. We know as we sit here tonight, not all our people are prospering. The opportunity for the next mayor is to be bold enough to keep the momentum of the city going in a physically responsible way, but to ensure that we're taking the dividends from that prosperity and investing in education, transportation, infrastructure, and affordable housing. Two miles from where we sit to North Nashville tonight or three miles out in Owensville Road, in many respects you feel like you're 50 or 60 miles away. They can be worlds apart. Or you spend time in Madison, Donaldson, Bellevue, or Antioch, and the two questions you get is we see all the investment going into downtown, but when is our turn or how do we benefit from that? The next mayor will have the opportunity to begin to use that prosperity and push economic development and push investment in each of those key areas throughout the city. Thank you very much. Are there any rebuttals? Ms. Berry. Ms. Berry for a 30 second rebuttal. Over the last seven and a half years, we have bet on Nashville. We've bet on ourselves. We've invested in Nashville. And we put a lot of that investment into the city core. And that's been important for our tourism business, but we have to take that now out all the way to the county line. And it, uh, leaders, they take risks. They have a vision and they get things done. Last week we announced 1,400 new jobs for Southeast Davidson County and a 500 plus new park. It's about taking risks and it's about having a vision, but it's making it you, all Barry. the way to the county line. Thank Any other rebuttals? Well, I'll move on to the next question. Ms. Berry will be first, and then Mr. Fox will also have this question. The state has enacted a law allowing people with legal permits to own a gun to carry them in state parks, yet signs saying the opposite are staying up in many cities. As mayor, do you think you have a role in speaking up about gun safety and gun rights, and what would you say? Ms. Berry. So during my time on the Metro Council, I stepped up and I led on keeping guns out of our parks. I believed that children should be in our parks and not guns. Recently, the state legislature said, actually, that guns can be in our state, park, in our state parks and in our local parks. I am sad that the state legislature has taken away the ability for local government to reflect what our citizens want. As the next mayor, I will continue to work with the state legislature so that we can hopefully come to an agreement 
where when we decide something at the local level, the state will respect it. The signs that we have in our parks now are confusing. And we are waiting for legal opinions to tell us what we need to do. But what I can tell you is from my perspective, we don't need guns in parks. As I said before, children should be in our parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Fox. I'm a fan of the Second Amendment. I think it's very good that people have the right and we protect to defend that right. But also I'm a fan of local governance and local control. It doesn't matter what the issue is. Uh, my preference is to have local governments make these decisions. I understand the sensitivity of those who own guns and again, as we are out knocking doors, we have a lot of discussions about that. It's, it's a very emotional issue. It's a very uh, instinctive issue for so many people that I take very seriously. And I have a lot of regard and respect for the seriousness with which they regard uh, gun ownership. As I said, my preference is local control uh, in most everything. I think we have better government the more we can control it locally. And so that's where I come down on that issue. Thank you very much. Any rebuttals? Very well, we'll move on to the next question. And uh, we'll have Mr. Freeman and Ms. Berry on this question. And the question is, around town, people constantly say they do not want Nashville to turn into Atlanta. What does that mean to you, and how must Nashville differentiate itself? Mr. Freeman. <clears throat> what that means to me is one thing, traffic. That, that, that's what's wrong with Atlanta, is, is the traffic and, and the, just the overwhelming growth that they've had. Uh, that's why we've got to start to work on this mass transit system. Uh, I like to say that uh, uh, we're 10 years late in getting started uh, on the program. It'll probably take eight to 10 years to complete it. We're 20 years behind before we, we turn a spade of dirt. But we've got to get started on a real mass transit system that connects all these communities in the mid-state area, Murfreesboro, uh, Franklin, Lebanon. We've got to collect, connect all of those areas. They've got to be, uh, participate in the solution. Uh, it's going to take help from everyone from the courthouse to the White House and everybody in between. But we've got to start working on that problem. Uh, I think I'm the man that can do that. Um, I know that there's no funding available right now for that, but that pendulum will swing and it will change, and in two years or three years or four years, uh, there will be funding, and we'll go after that funding aggressively. Um, we can't not work on it today because there's no funding today. We'll find the funding. Uh, if you rank the top 50 cities in the country in terms of population, the top uh, national ranks about number 49. The top 48 have one thing in common. They all have mass transit. And, um, and we're number 49, don't have it. It's our time. We need to start working on it, and we'll find the funding to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. Ms. Berry. When I talk to groups, and I say, we don't want to be Atlanta. What they say to me is, that's about transit and transportation. I actually like Atlanta. It's a fun place to go visit. And they have an Ikea, which is really cool. So as your next mayor, I'll work to bring an Ikea here. But all right, we'll talk about that in a minute. For me, it is about having a comprehensive plan for mass transit. We have to be bold. The numbers are one to seven billion dollars that we're going to have to spend. We're going to have to bet on ourselves. We're going to have to take a risk. We're going to have to have a regional transit system. But you're not going to get out of your car in Rutherford County or Williamson County if you can't get around when you get here. So it's about regional and local approach. For me, that local approach is so critical because it's not just about the tourists that need to get around. It's about my neighbor, my neighbor who lives on a fixed income, who can't afford to have a car and insurance, yet she needs to get to the grocery store. Right now, she has to go downtown and change and come back in order to do that. That's not right. The people who need our transit the most are the people who depend on it the most, who can usually afford it the least. In my administration, we're going to look at ways that our funding model works so that everybody can have transit. Thank you very much. Any rebuttals? Uh, Mr. Bone. The, the GPS mapping device TomTom Tom, aggregates all their data and then, le and then uh, releases a report 
What they recently said is we're the 23rd worst city for congestion. The good news is Atlanta is 15, so we've still got a little room to go there. <laughs> I'll give the mayor of Atlanta credit. He recently said if you don't have a transit problem, you have a far worse problem. Uh, so we shouldn't be satisfied with that, but we don't have to be Atlanta. You look at a city like Denver who thought 15, 20 years out and solved the regional funding piece. As mayor, that's what I'll do from a regional approach. Thank you very much. Mr. Kane. A friend of mine recently talked about Atlanta and said every 10 years they tear everything down and restart. And we cannot afford to do that here in Nashville. As we talk about transit, as we talk about investing in our neighborhoods and job growth, we have to protect and preserve what makes us such a unique and special place, our neighborhoods, but also the Ryman. So when we talk about transit, I'll be a relentless preserver of what makes us special and unique here so we don't become Atlanta. Ms. Eskind Riverbend. <laughs> We can fix our traffic congestion problems and not be Atlanta by putting technology in our traffic lights. How would you like to be able to move when the light is red and no one is going the other way and it's green? I have proposed we put real-time adaptive sensors in those traffic lights and in the streets so that you have applications to know how to get where you need to go so you won't be stuck in traffic. And just a, an unfortunate we've maximized uh, rebuttals here. We're, we're gonna move on to the next question. You've used both of them. So at this moment, uh, Ms. Berry, Ms. eskin Reprovic, and Mr. Bowen are the only ones left with a rebuttal for this round. Uh, so this next question is for Mr. Fox, uh, Ms. eskin Reprovic, and Mr. Gentry. And the question is, The Economist recently featured Nashville extensively in an article over the growing Hispanic community, which is expected to grow from 10% to 34% over the next 25 years. What would your approach be to working with this important community? Mr. Fox. Right. Nashville has improved so much when I was a kid. I grew up here, and it's such a more um, uh, rich, culturally rich, and prosperous community. And so much of it is because people from all over the country, from all over the world, have decided to throw in their lot with us to fulfill their dreams here in Nashville. My wife, Carrington, is on the board of Casa Azafran, which is doing terrific work, helping Latinos especially get, you know, get some traction in our local economy. I'd like to see a little more focus on the entrepreneurial side. We have also at um, Casa Azafran a incubator for restaurateurs. Well, I'd like to see if we could harness some of the skills and resources that exist at the Entrepreneur Center and bring those to bear for our new American community. I think there's a big opportunity to facilitate the uh, development of jobs and new businesses that we see from our uh, uh, new, new arrivals here in town. Mayor Dean has done a terrific job, in my view, of making clear that we are a very, very welcoming city you know, the new Americans who come here, that's our next leadership cadre. Those are the people who will be leading our city in the civic life. And, and more importantly, I think more conspicuously, it's the new Americans of today who will be the business leaders of tomorrow. So anything we can do to facilitate that, I think Mayor Dean has done, frankly, a terrific job. And I would like to put more of a focus on entrepreneurial development. Thank you. Ms. Eskin, reprobate. We are so lucky that Nashville mirrors the U.S. in terms of our demographics and our growing Hispanic community is a huge part of that and I will embrace that community. I will make sure that they have the same life that everyone else is, no matter what their background, no matter what their economic position is. Why shouldn't they? They should have the same quality jobs. They should have the same education. They should have the same ability to have a high quality of life, be safe, have affordable housing, and I'm going to do that by supporting and funding the Office of New Americans that Mayor Dean has already put in place, continuing that on. I'm going to do that by making sure that my team is very knowledgeable about the needs of the Hispanic in every, every part of the community. And I also agree that we need to bring the same kind of public partnerships, private partnerships, that we've got in other parts of the city. Bring that entrepreneur center to the new Americans, to the Hispanic uh, community. But instead of looking at it as financing new businesses, what we can do is help them grow organically because they are business leaders. They are creating jobs. They are doing a phenomenal job making sure that they grow their businesses. But we can help them do that by bringing the public-private partnership together to make that happen. I am very, very proud to be in Nashville that has the mirrors this kind of demographic uh, community in our city. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Gentry. You know, I told this story a couple days ago, and, 
And I said it was the first time I ever told it, and I never dreamed I'd tell it on TV. But uh, my dad's parents were born into slavery. My mother grew up on a plantation in Georgia. Both of them were raised by their sisters and brothers. Both of them were educated, and both of them were given opportunities. And they were able to raise their son, and their son was educated, and he was given opportunities, and here he is. Well, this is not about slavery. This is about education and opportunity. And the fact is, not just the Latino community, but all the immigrant community should have an opportunity or a chance to have the best education possible. And they should also have a chance at opportunities. With education and opportunity, they will have the same chance to grow and to become productive citizens in this community that I've had. And not only can they rise to the levels that I've, and my parents have had a chance to, but they can go beyond. So I'll be that mayor that's always cognizant and always pushing for education and opportunity for all people. Our immigrant community deserves it. We will be a contradiction if we don't provide it for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Due to uh, the time we have, so Mr. Boeing, you'll have a rebuttal. This will be the last question, so you're more than welcome to use your rebuttal for Thank this uh, one before we go into our last round. If you elect me as mayor, we will continue as a city to embrace the mindset that regardless of where you are born, you will be treated with dignity and respect. But in addition to that, we'll make sure that we continue to give in all of Nashville, all of our people, the tools to thrive from education to affordable housing to transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Berry. When we beat back English only several years ago, we sent the message that Nashville is a warm and welcoming place. And when I go out and talk to folks in the Somali community, the Kurdish community, in the Hispanic community, what strikes me the most is there are no they, it's we. And we all want the same things. High quality education, transit, affordable housing, and we want Nashville to be a prosperous place. That's what I'll do as your next mayor. Thank you very much. At this point, we are gonna to move to the final round of this debate, and it's one question for every single candidate, and it's a one minute answer. And the question is, why are you the best qualified candidate to be mayor of Nashville? And we'll start with Ms. Linda Rebervik, uh, Eskin Rebervik, pardon me, and we'll uh, go all the way down to Ms. Berry. Nashville's in a fantastic place. And as your leader and your mayor, I will make sure that Nashville continues to grow, that Nashville continues to work with education, transportation, and infrastructure, and that Nashville's livable for all of our families. As your mayor, I will be the leader that brings people together, does not drive them apart. And I'm proving that by running a positive campaign. No negative ads. I am the most uniquely qualified candidate to be your next mayor. We have a $1.8 billion operating budget. I have led a $1 billion sales business. I have been on the boards of companies that have multi-billion dollars in revenue, that have thousands, tens of thousands of employees around the world. I am battle-tested and ready to make the tough decisions on day one that need to be made to make sure that Nashville continues to grow and faces the challenges that are ahead of us, I would appreciate your vote for Linda eskin Rebervik as mayor on August the 6th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. King. At its simplest, the job of a mayor is to wake up every morning focused on getting results. I'm proud to have a record to run on, and I'm proud of the results that we achieved at Lead Public Schools. Just tonight, our second class graduated 100% and 100% were accepted to a four-year college. But as proud as I am of those results, I'm prouder of how we achieved those results. And that is why I believe I am the most qualified to be your next mayor, is we reached out to the district when Cameron was struggling and we partnered. Normally, charters and district schools are not supposed to partner, but we did. We partnered with faith, uh, faith organizations as well as nonprofits to do the right things for our kids. As your next mayor, 
no one will be more energetic, no one will be more innovative, no one will be more collaborative. So years from now, when my daughter and all of our children retire from jobs that we helped create and are living in neighborhoods that are still in unique and special, they can say that we were at our best when they needed us most. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Mr. Gentry. I'm your best choice for mayor because I have the most experience. I was educated in public school systems. I have here, I have four children. Two are still in, two have graduated. I was a banker for almost eight years. I worked in higher education for 15 years. I've run three nonprofits as CEO. I've worked at the Chamber of Commerce for four years. I was councilman at large, chair of budget and finance, vice mayor, I'm currently a criminal court clerk. I understand government. I understand nonprofits. I understand the community with all my civic responsibilities and duties that I have done. I am the person that can wrap his arms around this entire city, that can move this city forward, that can make decisions that need to be made right now and make them not for today, but for the next 10, 20 years. Howard Gentry is your mayor thank, of the future. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Gentry. Mr. Freeman. Thank you. I think I'm uniquely qualified to be mayor because the issues that are on the table in front of us are issues that, that I've got a unique perspective on. Affordable housing is something I've spent my career working on. I know how to, how to solve that problem. I know what we need to do. Uh, I've explained that to you. There's more on our website if you'd like to, uh, to look at it. But uh, I I'm uniquely qualified in terms of afford affordable housing. I'm also uniquely qualified in terms of mass transit. Most of the people on this stage thought the AMP was the, the best idea they'd ever heard of, and that was the solution to our mass transit problem. I didn't think that. I said that at the time. I think what we need is this regional mass transit system that I've talked to you about. There's more about that on the website if you'd like to look at it. I'd love the opportunity to serve. Uh, I don't have any other office, political office, that I'll ever look at after this. This is what I want to do to give my hometown back something for all that they've given me, and I would appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fox. I've had the privilege to lead some good-sized organizations, but some of the other folks up here have done that as well. So the question is, how do we align on the issues? If you see the exciting downtown projects and think maybe it's time to tack back to the neighborhoods with a little TLC, I might be a good candidate for you. If you look at our debt load and are concerned about the credit card balance we're leaving from the city for our children, I could be a good candidate for you. If you're concerned about the urgency of getting in charge of this infrastructure improvement and transit, uh, I could be a good candidate for you. If you're concerned about crime, if you've been a victim of crime, know someone who has, or just very frustrated that violent criminals are not staying locked away as long as they should, I should be someone you could c consider. So these are, the, uh, these are the issues that I think are, are front and center. If we agree on four or four or three or four, I could be a good candidate for you. I think we have good alignment. Two out of four, still pretty good. One out of four, I don't know. Zero for four, I'm probably not your cup of tea, but love to have a conversation. My cell phone is 615-828-1193. Love to have Thank a conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks. Fox. <laughs> Mr. Bones. I have four things to offer you. I've got real world business experience and understand that the business cannot take the creation of jobs by the business sector for granted. I've got relevant experience with the business of Metro government and understand that this is a hard, complicated $1.9 billion business. Third, my wife and I have the opportunity to see this city through the eyes of our four, four children and to see the city that we want them to grow up in today, but also the community that we want them to be a part of 50 years from now. And fourth, I really want to be your mayor. For me, this is not about one issue. This is not about my next job and certainly not about personal gain. I want to be mayor because I want to execute on a vision for the city of Nashville that says we keep our momentum going in a responsible way, but we now diversify that prosperity in all of Nashville. I am Charles Robert Bone, and I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Bone. <laughs> Ms. Barry. I 
I came here to go to school, but I got so much more than my degree. I fell in love with Nashville. I met my husband, we raised our family, and I got my career started here. My passion for public service started with my neighborhood association. I didn't have millions, and I wasn't politically connected. I just knew I wanted to make my neighborhood better. On Metro Council, I've worked with Mayor Dean. We've brought jobs and improved our economy, and I have stepped up and led on important issues like non-discrimination, fair wages, and keeping our parks safe. The next mayor has an opportunity to lead an, at an exciting time, but we still have challenges. We have to improve our public schools for all of our children. We have to invest in our city to bring those high quality jobs, and we have to tackle our transit problems, all the while doing this by protecting our neighborhoods, keeping them safe and affordable. As your next mayor, I have a proven track record of leadership, Thank and I would be honored to earn Thank your you, vote Barry. and your Thank you. <laughs> so let, let's Thank give a you. round of applause to all of our candidates here. <laughs> on, behalf, on behalf of the Tennessean, Belmont University, and WFMB, thank you and good night. <laughs>